Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,234 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. We are continuing our messages I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This is the fourth of 25-week messages in our series covering the book of Hebrews. This message is titled, Messiah, Moses, and Me. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. Do you welcome Cameron and his mom, Jody, right? Do you welcome you here this morning. Appreciate you being here. They're friends of Amy and Scott, so thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for everybody that was, is here that braved the rain and the storms um, to be able to be with us and share with us. Now, last week, we continued our extended series on the book of Hebrews, which is found in the New Testament, and we focused on Jesus as the pioneer of our perfection. Now, I don't know that any of us are perfect, but Jesus Christ, through him, we can become perfect, at least in the eyes of God. And we learn three essential principles to have hope and suffering. We all suffer. We all go through difficulties. But we learned those three essential principles last week of how to have hope and suffering. And today we are looking, as Paula read, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And we'll explore how the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ, is greater than Moses. To fully understand the importance of this passage, we must take on the mindset of that first century Jewish Christian We here in America, in the Western world, have a hard time grasping the mindset of the ancient Near Eastern people of those days. So let us try to put on our mindset of that first century Christian Jew as we go through the passage today. But let's first begin to reread, as Paul read, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It's on page 1864 and 1865 in your pew Bibles. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters... Who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful to in all of God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of the house is great, has greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything." Moses was faithful as a servant in God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken to God uh, by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house, and we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and hope in which we glory. Now the words of Hebrews is certainly God-breathed. They're inspired, they're their inerrant word of God. But unfortunately, sometimes the chapter breaks and the chapter verse breaks get in the way. These artificial insertions that make citations and cross-referencing much easier for us to read and look up in the Bible, nevertheless, it's hard to know how we would function without them, but the chapters and verses are helpful, those breaks, but sometimes it makes it look like or gives the impression that the author was stopping here and beginning with a new train of thought here, and that's not the case between chapters 2 and verse, and chapters 3 of Hebrews. When we step into Hebrews chapter 3, we shouldn't imagine a door separating those two chapters. Instead, the author pieces together what we learned in chapters 1 and 2 and connects those to chapter 3. The author ties those together. Now, I have a couple lanyards up here, and I'll receive probably another lanyard in this conference I'm going to, and these are separate. But what the author of Hebrews is doing is connecting those together. So that it's one contiguous piece of information that we need to absorb into our lives. And that's what we need to focus on today. We may be stepping from one thought to another, but it's an open door. It's not something starting a whole new piece of information. The author expects us to take along everything we learned in Hebrews 1 and 2 and bring it in to Hebrews 3. In the previous chapters, the author continued to develop the theme that Christ is superior in his person and his work. And not only is he superior to the prophets and the angels that we studied about in chapters 1 and 2, but having persevered through temptation, through pain, through death, he's also superior to our temptation, our sin, and our suffering. As such, he's here to help us and is available right now. 
Whenever we find ourselves being threatened by that rise of flooding, of the raging storms of suffering and sin and temptation that we have in our lives, which all of us deal with, in addition, Jesus is here to help us in our trials, our temptation, and he is faithful to come to our aid. As we learn in Hebrews 2, verses 16 through 18, he suffered everything we suffered. He was tempted in every way we were tempted, and yet he did not sin so he can help us through what we're suffering. With this basic understanding that Christ is superior as a prophet, priest, and king, the author of Hebrew is ready to hit the Jewish Christians of that day, put on their mindset of that first century Jewish Christian with the truth that would likely shock them. It would actually hurt them, and that is the ministry of Moses, because Moses is considered the most important person in all of scriptures to those first century Jews. As Hebrews opens in the powerful appeal to have their keep their faith placed in Messiah, which they trusted in the Messiah as their Savior, but now they were wavering. They're wanting to go back to that law because it was so comfortable. They had a rule, set of rules and regulations to follow, but now with the grace of Christ, it opens back up. And they were starting to, to wonder, maybe that law was more comforting to us. Maybe it was easier to follow that law than this grace through the Messiah. So the author calls them, though, brothers and sisters who share in this heavenly calling. If you remember last week, we talked about being siblings of Jesus Christ. He considers us siblings, and he takes us before the throne of God, before this divine council of angels, and says, I'm not ashamed to call these my followers, my brothers and sisters, my siblings. We have been saved by the blood of Christ, forgiven, set apart, and we're indwelled by that Holy Spirit. We are part of God's family. We are brothers and sisters to one another. We are heaven bound where Christ has already made a way for us so that we can proceed into heaven boldly before his throne. Now, the first word in chapter one of verse three is therefore, as I was taught in Bible school years ago, if you see therefore, it means you better look for what it's there for. And it indicates a deduction from the previous discussion that the basis for an action, therefore, is saying, what I talked about before, we're going to look and apply now. Because Jesus is superior to the prophets and the angels, he was faithful to God, he was merciful to us, he's willing to help us, and he's able to help us. In light of all these weighty facts that we discussed in chapters 1 and 2, we ought to, it goes on to say, fix our thoughts on Jesus. Now, the Greek word translated as fixing our thoughts is katanoeo. And it's to fix your thoughts means to observe carefully, to pay attention to, not to simply think about in passing, but completely and utterly immerse ourselves in deeply. The essence, in essence, the author is saying, you Jewish believers in the Messiah, because of the superiority in the person and the work of Christ, you better think carefully about him. Don't give a, just a fleeting glance or a knowing nod. Observe Jesus Christ. Pay attention to him. Get to know him. So we have to ask ourselves the question, what do we see when we focus on Jesus Christ? We see that in this passage here, he is our apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, the Greek word translated apostle comes from, means one sent forth. And this is the only verse in the entire Bible where Jesus is referred to as an apostle. Now, we normally think of apostles as ones who followed Jesus himself. They were sent into the world, but this notion fits well with the prayer that Jesus was praying with his disciples right before his trial and crucifixion, where in John chapter 17, verse 18, he says, just as you sent me into the world, speaking of God sent Jesus Christ into the world, so he was a sent one, I am sending you into the world. So indeed, he was an apostle to us because he was sent to the world to become the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. The author was likely drawn again on the assertion that Jesus was superior to the prophets and the angels. Drawn against that assertion that they were sent by God, a messenger to God. If you remember, the angels were here to provide ministering to us as believers who accepted that salvation rendering service to us. And it's a rare title to Christ in this verse because it's the only one in the entire scripture where Christ is considered an apostle. 
the heavenly origin, and it strengthens the reality of our own heavenly calling. Besides the fact that Christ serves as our supreme apostle, he also functions as our supreme high priest. Now, what was the purpose of a high priest? It was to go before God for the sins of the people. And that was his function. Not only is Christ the supreme high priest over all, he was the perfect mediator between God and humanity. As we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, he is our great high priest. Christ satisfies the desperate spiritual needs, that deep longing, that bridge building between God and humanity, between heaven and between earth. A longing expressed movingly by the words of Job a millennia ago. And Job said, God is not mortal like me, so I cannot argue with him or take him to trial. If only there were a mediator between us, someone who could bring us together. That mediator is Jesus Christ. He is our great high priest. We don't need an earthly priest to go before God because Jesus Christ is there on our behalf as our high priest. And because he is our divine apostle, he was sent from on high to lead us heavenward. You remember the illustration last week, he clears the path for us that we might go before God. Prophets, angels, high priests, kings. These are all in the minds of the Jewish readers of this letter to the Hebrews. Is a significant figure was still missing though. Of all those four that I mentioned, there was one person in the first century Jewish Christian mind that was greater than ever any other person to ever live, and that was Moses. But Christ, we see in this passage, is superior to the person in the work of Moses. He too, Moses, was sent by God. He too stood between God and the nation of Israel as a mediator. He went before God for the nation of Israel. No other figure in the Old Testament would have been as highly esteemed by those Jewish people that first century. Had the author of Hebrew just been interesting in flattering the people of, of his day that he was writing to, he would have never mentioned Moses, and especially the fact that Jesus Christ was superior to Moses. He would have not broached that subject because they would have had to take it difficult and say, well, how can anyone be greater than Moses. Moses, of course, had spoken to God face to face as Deuteronomy chapter 34, 10 makes a big deal out of the fact. In contrast to the, any other of the prophets, he says, there's never been another prophet in all of Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He went right before God face to face. Moses had received the law and then passed it on to the nation of Israel. He had led the Hebrews out of slavery of Egypt through the Red Sea those miracles that he performed through God. He had revealed the plans of constructing the tabernacle, which was the precursor or the forerunner to the temple where sacrifices and offerings would take place. So let's put on that first century Christian mindset. The Jewish mind could not imagine anyone, any person on earth, which was equal to Moses. And the thought of one who was superior to Moses would have shocked their senses. And that's why the author of Hebrews wrote it. He says, you have to understand, Moses was great, but Jesus was greater. Therefore, Jesus is superior even to Moses. Now, God appointed Moses and the Messiah as mediators, mediators of his message. Both served him faithfully, and therefore, both deserved honor and glory, as we were told in verses 2 and 3. But notice the author doesn't disparage Moses in any way. He doesn't cut Moses down by lifting up Christ, and that's a good lesson for us. We should never cut somebody else down in order to be lifted up ourselves. We can lift up others without disparaging ourselves also. Now, the honor properly due to Moses as a great servant of God is compared to the honor due to the Messiah. Now, if you look at your bulletin insert today, you know, on the side it says, Messiah, Moses, and me. Why the Messiah is worthy of a greater honor than Moses. And I have three points here that describe the reason why the Messiah is worthy of greater honor. The first one is the Messiah is more glorious than Moses because he is the builder of God's house. <clears throat> Verses 3 and 4. Now the term house here in the Greek is oikos, and it's used metaphorically seven times in verses 2 through 6. 
It refers not to a physical structure like the sanctuary or the temple or even our church building here, but to the people of God. Even ancient Greek usage of the term refers figuratively to a family as a household. Before the birth of the church at Pentecost, the term house referred figuratively to Israel. And we're told this in Hosea chapter 1, verse 4, Matthew 10, verse 6, and Hebrews 3, verse 2. But after Pentecost, it would be also referred to as the church in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 15, and Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6. Moses was a member of God's household of the Old Testament, the people of Israel. He was an Israelite. He was a member of that house. He served as their leader during the time of their exodus from Egypt. He led them through the wilderness. He was a member of that nation. He was part of that house in verse 3. Yet Christ was the builder of that house. A surprising statement in verse 4 spells out the reason Christ, as the builder of the spiritual house, deserves, he deserves greater honor than Moses. Because it says in verse 4, God is the builder of everything. And who did God use as part of that Godhead? Jesus Christ is the author of creation. So Jesus Christ is the builder of everything. In simple or subtle terms, the author of, of Hebrew attributes the work of Jesus, the attributes of Jesus' work to God. As Jesus is not only the builder of the church, but he is the craftsman of all creation. The second reason why the Messiah is worthy of greater honor is the Messiah is more glorious than Moses because he is a fulfillment of Moses' testimony in verse 5. Now, through Mo though Moses faithfully carried out the duties of the God's house as a servant with his task to bear witness, it says in verse 5, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. That was Moses' purpose, to bear witness to what would be talked about in the future. In other words, Moses' ministry was a foreshadowing of Jesus, Jesus Christ. It appointed him as to point to Jesus Christ, anticipating his coming. Jesus demonstrated that after his resurrection, when he said in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, then he said, when I was with you before, that means before his crucifixion and resurrection, I told you everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. And Jesus explained to his followers a little bit earlier in that same chapter in verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets. And all that Moses and the prophets, the angels all pointed to Jesus Christ. Clearly, to the one Moses was pointing to, is worthy of more glory than Moses himself. And third, the third reason the Messiah is worthy of greater honor is the Messiah is more glorious than Moses because he is the ruler of God's house. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, not only is Christ the builder of God's spiritual people in verses 3 and 4, but Christ is the faithful as a son over God's house in verse 6. This means Christ is the heir of God's household the one who inherits the rights as the firstborn, as if he were the firstborn of all creation. <clears throat> in fact, the author of Hebrews already uses that firstborn analogy in chapter 1, verse 6, and Paul uses the same as he describes in Colossians chapter 1, 1 verse 15, where Jesus is metaphorically described as the firstborn of all creation. He wasn't literally a born creature because he was from eternity past. He created all things. Yet this is a little bit of a different emphasis here. Colossians focused on Christ as the recipient of authority over heaven and earth. In Hebrews um, chapter 3, verse 6, zooms in on Christ's headship over all of God's people, the church. Colossians chapter 1, verse 18 says, Christ is also the head of the church, which is this body. And then Paul describes even further in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, as he pulls all these ideas together, he says, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. So Christ is the head of the church. And he's the creator of the church, the creator of the house of God. Moses never, was never exalted to such a position as this, of a, the, a supreme authority that Christ had. Christ was the son the firstborn, the head of all things. Now, if you look at your bulletin insert on the bottom section there in that grid, I'm comparing Messiah and Moses. Now, we have some similarities, but we also have differences. Similarities is 
both Moses and Messiah were appointed by God, but Moses was worthy of some glory, while the Messiah is worthy of greater glory. <clears throat> Moses and Messiah were both faithful to God. Moses was a member of God's house. Messiah was the builder of God's house. Similarities, both were responsible for God's house. Moses was a servant of God's house, but the Messiah was son over God's house. <clears throat> and the fourth sim similarity is both were mediators of revelation. Moses testified to the coming things. Messiah fulfilled what Moses had talked about. The author is trying, not trying to disparage Moses, as I mentioned, by comparing Moses and Messiah. He wasn't belittling Moses in the process. Instead, he was demonstrating that Jesus Christ is beyond comparison. There's no one that could compare with Jesus Christ the Messiah. Even the most significant person in all of biblical history, Moses, was no comparison to Christ. Jesus Christ is superior over all things, all people, in his person, in his work. <clears throat> As we look at the last half of verse 6 here, the superiority of Jesus will do us no good if we don't place him superior in our, in our own lives. This was the problem facing those Jewish Christians of that first century. They were tempted to abandon the Messiah, to go back to those laws of Moses which they were so comfortable under because they knew exactly what to do and not to do, whereas both through the grace of Christ, he gives us freedom from that law. And we have to, by God's leading and the Holy Spirit indwelling in us, decide, is this right or prudent for me as a believer? This would have been a disaster for them to step back to a lesser ministry, an inferiority, inferior ministry, Never forgetting the purpose of the writing of the book of Hebrews, the author emphasizes the second part of Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, his reader's response to the superiority of Jesus Christ. He reminds them, first, we are his house, but he goes on to say the author seems to place a conditional element in their promise. He says, if indeed we hold firmly to the confidence and hope in which we have, which we glory. Now, at first blush or first look at this, the verse might seem to say, well, if you fail in following Christ, then somehow you're kicked out of God's household, disowned and disinherited. Does salvation is contingent on our spiritual faithfulness? Absolutely not. If you remember in the series, What Does God Want? We affirm that salvation could never be gained by moral perfection. Therefore, it cannot be lost by moral imperfection. It's not whether we remain sinless before God that we're members of his household because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it's not conditional. Our salvation is conditional on our performance because our performance could never meet God's standards. But the conditional instruction indicated by if has sometimes different meanings. Sometimes it does indicate conditional relationships as in this phrase, if you eat your broccoli, you can then have dessert. Now, the implication is, if you don't eat it, no dessert for you. Now, this is how the author uses this term. He's saying the continuance of your faith and hope proves the reality that your Christian faith is authentic, that you are truly a member of God's family. Remember the term we used or learned in What Does God Want series? Believing loyalty. Loyalty will show that you're a believer. As a believer, you will remain loyal to Jesus Christ in the precepts that God set forth in his words. We shouldn't obsess over another person's life if they temporarily go astray, if they have a lapse or they fall or they struggle to get up. We all have dips and valleys in our life, our spiritual lives, our spiritual growth. However, if we can look over a lifespan of a person and see a general faithfulness to God and the desire to live for him, that is a sign that they truly are a part of God's family. That's proof that backs up the reality of their claim or our claim. And if a person claims to be a Christian and it appears to have fallen entirely away, they reject God completely, they turn their back on their faith, then perhaps... That person was never truly a member of God's family or they've just completely rejected him and it says, I do not believe. They've rejected that loyalty that they have in God. We will never be kicked out of God's family because we stumble and we fall. 
because we fall short of God's precepts, because every day we fall short of God's precepts. That's not what God's in the author of Hebrews is talking about here. He's talking about those who are genuinely part of the family will at least, you'll see a consistent effort to live for the Lord in their lives. Those who are genuinely part of that household of faith live under the Father's roof and the Son's watchful eye. However, it does not mean that we're immune to stumbling and tripping and even falling flat on our faces. I know I do that way too often. We never cease to be frail and fallen and vulnerable people, but we're saved by grace, grace through the faith in Christ alone. But those who are true believers, therefore a member of God's household of faith, and have Jesus Christ as our high priest that we can go before God, we are members of his household of faith. He ministers to us like no one else can. He catches us when we stumble, when we fall. As we talked about last week, when we fall flat on our faces, he doesn't grind our faces in the muck and the mire. No, he picks us back up and says, let's wipe that muck off and let's keep moving forward. We endure with faith and hope, with Christ at our side to the end, then we will manifest indeed that we are part of his household. Now the message was somewhat something the Hebrew believers desperately needed to hear because they were persecuted by not only the fellow Jews who were not Christians, but also the Roman Empire who were persecuting the Christians at that point. So they needed something to hold on to. Some had fallen away. Others were teetering. Others were reaching out for something steady to help them be assured of their faith. The author points to Christ, who was superior over all things, even superior to Moses. All we needed to do was assert our faith and hope, our confidence in him, not the good works, not spiritual disciplines, not striving to make ourselves worthy of God's in his eyes, but our confidence in Christ. That's why we as believers don't need to fear. We can have confidence in Christ because regardless, knowing that we will fall at times, that we still are secure in Christ. Behind the hopeful message is a hint of a warning, though, that if you didn't endure in your faith, but instead abandoned their Messiah and ran back to Moses, their claims of members of being members of God's household would be suspect or in question. Only by getting right with Christ and following him would that identity as God's children be assured and evident to everybody else. If you look in your other side of your bold and insert today, What's the application of Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6? Like those first century Hebrew believers, each of us today must make the decision. Moses or Messiah? Are we going to follow a set of laws or rules to show that we're believers, or are we going to trust in the Messiah? You'd think it'd be an easy decision to make, especially after reading the passage in Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. If the Messiah is God in the flesh the center of all biblical prophecy and the human history and the savior of sinners, including Moses, why would anyone choose to follow Moses? Why would anyone choose a set of rules and regulations to fall back on? Why would anyone choose Moses instead of Messiah? The apostle John made this contrast equally clear in the first part of his, his narrative in John chapter 1, verse 17. He says, for the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. Yet, I'm constantly astonished how some Christians will fall back on trying to follow a set of rules and regulations saying, well, I'm spiritual because you can see these rules and regulations that I follow. That's not what this is about. Following by faith in Jesus Christ is what it's about. Others make a list of do's and don'ts. Do eat this, don't drink that, do shop here, don't, do, don't support that. Do vote for this person. Don't talk to that person. Sometimes we as believers set up more laws than all the laws of Moses, which was extensive. And that's not for us to do. It's not for us to judge others. We can pray for others. We can assist others. We can come along beside them and help them if they're struggling in their walk. But for us, we need to follow the Messiah. It is our study, in our study of Hebrews, we consider a group of people that are wavering between Moses and Messiah. It's harder for us to understand that today because we're not first century Jewish Christians. We weren't brought up 
in the Torah all of our lives. But we struggle between law and grace, between that old covenant and the new covenant. And we have, through the book of Hebrews, many opportunities sort of to revisit this dilemma that they're going through. But as we seek plainly to plant our feet firmly on Christ, his grace, and consider focusing on the passages of scriptures. I've listed three passages here. It says, plant your feet firmly upon Christ and his grace. Study the following passages and they'll help us to realize that our faith is in Christ alone, not on the works of the law. Galatians chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. Galatians chapter 1, verses 1, or 5, verses 1 through 6. And Galatians chapter 5, verses 18 through 23. So take time. I would encourage you to take time to study these this week. Meditate on them. Ponder them. If you are so inclined, commit them to memory. And I know as we get older, that becomes more of a chore for all of us. But these are great passages to really plant your feet firmly on the truth that the Messiah is greater than Moses. But the choice goes back to Moses or Messiah. Both are great, but Christ is greater. And that's the passage of short passage that we have here. Next Sunday, we'll continue our series on an adventure through the book of Hebrews. And as I mentioned, the first seven weeks covers a topic called the Christ is superior in his person. And next week, the message will be beware of a hard heart. So please read Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 19 in preparation for next week's message. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this book of Hebrews. Although sometimes it's hard to get into the mindset of that first century Jewish Christian who, to whom the book was originally written to, and although it wasn't written directly to us, it is written for us, Father, that we might realize that Jesus Christ is superior to everything. He is the builder of the house. He is the head of the house. And we have the privilege, because he is our apostle and great high priest, to come boldly before your throne because Jesus Christ is intercessing for each of us, pleading our case, saying, Father, they believe. Don't hold their sin against them. We know that we are pure and holy in God's sight because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we thank you for this. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.